The Time Shift. Hello and welcome to The Time Shift for the first time in a very, very long time. This week I'm reviewing Doctor Who episode Star Beast. Let me know what you thought about it in the comment section down below. As you there, be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, click the bell and do all the YouTube stuff that YouTube wants you to do because YouTube is an increase in this very place to small content creators. Support your local small content creator today. It will do them a power of good and we do as we used to do with these particular reviews by starting out by talking about the story and the writing. I'll just say here and now before we get too far into the review itself, I am doing this review only about 10 minutes after having actually watched the episode itself. I'm going off the notes that I have and just effectively initial impressions kind of a feeling because I feel that I just want to get into this whilst the feeling is fresh in my mind and just give you an honest hand on heart reaction to this. And I just have to say here and now, and regretfully this is the moment where in comparison to a lot of other broadcasters on YouTube, I'm going to have to lower the tone and the temperature a little bit and say that episode was fine it was perfectly fine and perfectly enjoyable and as far as all of this kind of stuff is concerned it it ticked the boxes for me it did everything that i wanted it to do so apologies that i'm not going to be going into this with giddy abandon waving my arms and saying that this is the best thing ever and the good times are here again and i also apologize i'm not going to sit here and scream and shout and tell you why doctor who is ruined or that russell t davis needs to be sent to the moon or whatever i think this episode was for what it needed to be and what it was great there are some problems that i had with it and i feel that i might as well tackle this in a slightly semi-linear fashion by talking about the intro bit, you know, the little narration bit that we had with uh, David Tennant and Catherine Tate at the start of the episode. I'm going to be blunt, I really didn't like that. It feels a little bit like an afterthought to me. It feels like something they just put together because maybe they were a little bit worried that it had been a little bit too long since these two characters were on screen and we needed a bit of a refresher. But I honestly feel that that could quite easily have just been done with a quick last time on Doctor Who bit. I feel that that itself would have been just as effective. I really don't think the writing in this whole little intro bit really worked for me. There, was, well, there wasn't really a sense of artistry here. There was no sense of really much creativity. This was just a, a telling of things that happened in the form of a, a, a soliloquy and... I didn't really land for me. I think that the actual real e introduction to the o this episode, the real pre-title bit, should have been the Doctor landing and then he bumps into Donna and we get the thing of Rose and the husband and all that kind of stuff. I think that would have made for a far stronger opening. It feels a lot more in tone with the kind of program that we know and we love and the things that we do like from the Russell T Davis era. I will admit though, and this is, I don't really know where to put this, but... I really did not like the music that was used in the opening segment that I'm referring to, you know, the bit where the Doctor's meeting Donna again. I, like, I know that a lot of people have a lot of love for Murray Gold, and I think that most of the music that's been done with the score for this particular episode was great. It's just that, that music at the very start of it, it felt like stock music. I regret to say that. Granted, it doesn't quite feel quite as stock as the music that was used in that colorization of the Daleks episode that was broadcast on the anniversary a few days ago, but it did feel out of place. Maybe not as out of place as the soundtrack in the movie Nightcrawler, but it did feel like it was either going to be starting to be used for wacky shenanigans that never really kicked off or for an advert for coffee, which <laughs> is a whole other thing itself. I have to say that I do enjoy the kind of sense of time that we've been given with everything that goes on from that point on. Just the progression with Donna's life since leaving the Doctor and how her family has done their best to keep her away from all this science fiction mumbo jumbo stuff, which... <sighs> I'm in two minds about the joke of it, but I mean, if you're going to do a joke with it at this point, you kind of just have to lean into it. With Doctor Who in the modern era, London gets invaded almost every week, so you need some way to just explain it all away and just have her not looking at the right time or dismissing it as quackery or what have you. I suppose it works. I, I dare say that it might be a bit of a labour joke, but hey, I, I, it works for what it is and for the sake of the gang in that particular moment. Okay, it, it's, it's okay, it really is. I will say that I do... <laughs> oh, how do I put this? I, I, I have to say that pretty much everything up until the big twist moment later on in the episode, I did like. I really, again, I like to end up finding out what has happened with these characters since then, about uh, Donna and her daughter and her new husband, you know, all that coming together. 
course, the absence of Bernard Cribbings is... We're going to get a cameo appearance from him, I think, in the, even the next episode, the episode after that, which is something that all the fans are looking forward to. I honestly thought we'd get it in this episode, but we didn't, which is a shame, but we all know they had to do what they, as best as they could do with uh, old Mr. Cribbings, but that's just the way that it is. I will say that the big twist with the Meep, even without knowing that ahead of time, it was one of the things where it felt like it was coming a mile off. Like... I, I, there's a part of me that, yeah, was kind of thinking to myself, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it is just a cute little alien monster thing. It's And that's all it's going to be. And the aliens actually are the bad aliens. But no, it turned out that was the case. And I suppose part of it is also due to the fact that when you've been a fan of Doctor Who for as long as I have, eventually, sooner or later, you start to absorb the backstory and knowledge of all the other characters and monsters via osmosis. So, yeah, you kind of knew where this was going if you even had the most casual understanding of the source material but at the same time I, I think the episode started to really come alive and we had a little bit more of a discernible villain with all of this I think that the Meep's an interesting character just to have a villain who is just outright villainous and nasty sure they're not quite to the usual dark area that some Doctor Who va villains and baddies in the modern run can go but I think they work well for what they are this is a slightly more Saturday morning cartoon level villain and the episode itself has mostly low stakes for the most part of it but i think that it works if we're treating this as a fresh start if we're treating this as year zero the beginning point for many future fans having a villain which is ultimately just kind of evil for the sake of evil is fine we don't have to worry about the more headier morals of it all i think that it works i i i think that it might have taken us a little bit too long to get there but with that said I will say that I really love the pacing of this episode. One of the things I've always criticised Russell T Davies episodes about was always the fact that it always felt like 90% of the runtime was just the Doctor and their companion running along and pointing at stuff while the dun 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 music was playing in the background. And we didn't get that at all. This really felt like a fresh breath of fresh air for me by pretty much keeping a similar kind of pace to what Doctor Who has had since the latter half of the Matt Smith era. We're not running about like a mad thing trying to compress as much information as we can do into a confined period of time. Though I will admit that the third act of this did start to feel a little bit rushed and I feel that at this point we kind of have to start tossing a few of the negatives add with this episode not that many, I have to say, because I feel that at the end of the day, this episode is fine. There's just a few aspects of it that just kind of stick in my gut ever so slightly. For example, when we get the unit soldiers being introduced in their new body armor stuff, at that point, a little like thing just sparked in the back of my head and said, these guys are going to turn into bad guys. And the reason why that is, because I remember reading an article many years ago about why certain superhero characters never got their own movie, why it took so long for them to do a Black Widow movie, was because of the fact the character doesn't wear a mask. Because if the character wears a mask, then it's easy to just replace him with a stunt performer, or easy to just do CGI. And with this episode, you've got plenty of uh, stunt work when people started shooting at each other and blowing stuff up, so... At that point, I knew, right, something funny is going on here. Then the weird psychedelic <laughs> sun energy just possessed them. And then they started to become the, the Meep's loyal subjects. I, <laughs> What is it with Unit and finding themselves in these scenarios? I mean, just wow. <laughs> but hey, hey, to, to their credit, they were there in a decent whack of time. They actually was able to get there with some decent time. With, but again, like I said previously, London in this universe just seems to get invaded by aliens every other day. They may have just been wrapping something up just down the road and thought, oh, oh hey, hey, look, it doesn't rain but it pours, hardly working or working hard or whatever, and just had to go directly back into it. Oh, just one little, quick little positive as I'm just looking at my notes right now. There's a few little fun little references to previous Doctor Who eras. We do have a very, very, very minor hint to the Timeless Child stuff when we have the Doctor saying that he doesn't really know who he is anymore. I think that's kind of like a hinting towards that stuff, but let's be honest, they're not going to be touching that kind of stuff. Really any great focus for the foreseeable future. And I will say that there's that reference to the Shadow Protocol stuff, which I'm not a great fan of that scene. It was cute for what it was. It was nice to see the, the uh, alien bug guys just being your kind of just real space policemen. The 
the one that was a couple days away from retirement or whatever, which was a very laboured gag, but I suppose it worked for what it was, but, you know, pivoting into the negatives. And this is the one which might sound a little controversial, and I will admit that I'm still... I'm just... I'm still trying to process the whole twist scene, and seeing as, you know, this is a review of the episode, we can get into the spoilers of it, which is how they solve the problem of Donna's brain exploding. Like... Okay, I was always wondering exactly how we were going to end up doing this. Are we going to do this in this singular episode? Or is this going to be the big twist thing that's going to happen in the final episode? Is there going to be some kind of quirk that's going to be able to keep them chuggling along? No, okay, we're doing with this now. Oh, they were able to get away with it because their daughters shared some of the energy. Okay, so that itself feels a little bit forced, but okay. Let's be honest. Not the most forced thing within this episode, but okay, I'll accept that. But one of the things I really didn't like about the whole twist was that it really... <laughs> it's almost this sense of smugness with the writing with a case of, Oh, we've left all these clues for you throughout the episode! Oh, it was hidden within the toys! And it's the fact that the character that Rose is non-binary! Kind of, but she's transgender. I don't think those are the same thing, but... Okay? Like, it definitely feels like, okay, so this should be the moment where everyone at home is just going, Oh, wow, yeah, I didn't see... Oh, wow, that makes a lot of sense. But with me, I'm just kind of thinking, Hang on a minute. Hold on a second. Like, the big thing, of the real thing that really kind of ground my gears was the thing with the toys. Like, oh, all the toys that Rose has been making are actually references to previous adventures that Donna had with the Doctor. But we barely see them. There's only really visible in one scene and most of our attention is focused on the meep. Yes, there's that moment when they're hiding within the toys, but even then those toys are fairly indistinct. And the ones that almost literally say this is the case, the, the Rose is having some kind of memories, are ones that we don't see. Like, you know, the thing with the whole, like, fat monster thing and the rhino alien guy. Like, we don't see those, I don't think. Or they're so far in the background that we don't really see them that well. I think that's kind of more a fault with directing than necessarily with writing. But still, it was one thing that did stick out to me. As well as the whole uh, binary, non-binary thing, which I don't know how to feel about that. Because there's an element to me which, on the one hand, let's be honest, modern Doctor Who, as far as trans characters are concerned... It's kind of done a bit of a shitty job as pretty much every trans character that's been included in modern Doctor Who has either been a bad guy or just a joke. Like, we've had a flesh trampoline and a talking horse. That's as far as we've gone with all of this. The classic series only really had one and that was in an era where I don't really think you can make the connection to it anyway. So it's always been the modern run that's had the issue that we've tried to overcome here. And there's a part of me that can't help but feel that the implication that they're making here is Rose is transgender, not because, you know, that's how they identify and that's how they've grown and developed as an individual. It's because of wibbly wobbly timer whimy things, which I don't know how to feel about. It kind of reinterprets a very sensitive point for many people and turns into, I don't want to say a superpower, but it does kind of turn her whole identity into a plot point like this person just isn't the way that the way that they are because you know that's who they are they have all these other personality traits first but they also just happen to be transgender it just feels like that's the plot point the whole reason they exist is just for the plot point it almost feels like an extension of oh we've got this character in to show how woke we are oh god i'm, I'm really am i using that word oh christ but anyway you get the idea it feels like trying to make something that I'm not comfortable with but on the other hand I mean having a trans character actually does something in the show that isn't trying to blow up the world or being a punchline I'll accept like sure there's a bit there's things in Doctor Who's past which well you know what let's not go into that area because I can already imagine that people are going to be more pissed off at the fact that I wasn't gl glowing with how praise or how much I love this episode but still far as the writing is concerned I think it's a very strong episode this stuff in the second that were rather the third arc the uh, third act that doesn't quite fit out to me. I really think you could have dropped the opening narration bit. Really narrow down the ending stuff in the TARDIS for the love of Christ. Like, good lord, that stuff went on way too long. And the whole thing of Donna dropping the coffee into the TARDIS in a way that it feels like Catherine Tate was doing it so she wouldn't get bollocked for staying in the set. 
Eesh, like of all the ways to set up the next episode. Ooh, good lord. Anyway, with all that said, let us get into the performances. And this is another area that I feel I can talk about because I feel that I'm gonna I will, again controversial point at number three. I think that David Tennant is far better here than he was in the 50th anniversary episode because in the 50th anniversary episode, he kind of he, his accent sounded a little bit too Dick Van Dyke for my liking. Like this time sounds great, sounds good. In the 50th anniversary, not so much. It's many one of the many things I really didn't like about that. I will admit that I was hoping for a little bit more from him. I want to see a little bit more from him. But we're going to get that going forward. This is your typical post-regeneration episode. It's a lot of setup. It's a lot of building. It's a lot of establishing mystery. It's the actual time we get to spend with the actor doing their thing. Not so much. But at the same time, it's David Tennant playing the 10th Doctor again. I mean, they can't, they, they're trying to be coy about it and say that he isn't playing that character. You know, he's kind of like him. But he's different because he's not exactly that Doctor. He's the 14th Doctor. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, the, the, he's definitely an original character, yeah. <laughs> but still, performatively very good. I think that he really fits back into the role quite well. But of course, it helps that Russell T Davies is writing for him and they know each other quite well. Catherine Tate does this episode very well as well. I think that we do lose chance of her being at her most Catherine Tate-ness due to plot point. But she's fine for what she is. I will admit that I was never a massive fan of the Russell T. Davis era. I've never was really a fan of David Tennant's Doctor. And I really wasn't a fan of Catherine Tate's companion character. But at least it all kind of hung together and it all worked and it didn't make me want to gouge my eyes out. I think that together they work really well for each other. They have a great chemistry with one another. I want to see them together and doing stuff now. It is a shame that the new characters that we've been introduced to were probably not going to see this side of the end of the series. If not into Kutigatwa's run, but we'll soon see about that. But performatively, think they did very well. I think it's Miriam Marigold who did the voice of the Meep. I think that they did very well. I will be honest, I almost didn't recognise their voice at the start of it. It's only when they turned evil that I recognised the voice. I don't mean that as a slight against her. I think that she's a wonderful person, but all the same, you know, great performance. They played it with the sufficient level of theatrical evil that a character like that really needs. Uh, performatively, great performances all around, good. Some of the writing aspects of it, not so much. Now we're going to step into the overview, my thoughts overall. As I've said time and time and time again, I think this is a perfectly fine episode. Perfectly good, perfectly enjoyable. There are some aspects of it I don't like. I think certain aspects of the soundtrack didn't quite land for me. There's a little cameo appearance midway through the episode, which was neat, but don't really know why we needed it. But sure, it's fine for what it is. I... I think that the final act was a little bit rushed and could have been done better, but if I think that at the end of the day, what people wanted out of this episode, they wanted the feeling of watching Doctor Who back, and quite frankly, you, you got it. If you really wanted an evolved and improved version of the Russell T. Davis era, then this is it perfectly for you. It provides you everything that you need and more so. I think that many of the issues I had with that have been solved, but I won't get a full grasp on that, I think, until the next episode, which is next week, which is something I didn't realise. I, I thought the next episode wasn't going to be in called Christmas Day, but the Christmas Day episode is the first episode with uh, Kuti Gatwa in. So, you know, we'll see how we go between then and now. I think the episode, again, perfectly fine for what it was. It's not the grand revolution that I hoped it would be. I don't feel as though Doctor Who is back. But then with that said, I'm someone that never felt that it ever left. There's some people that feel that the Whitaker Chibnall era is when Doctor Who left. For some it was a Capaldi era. For some it was a Matt Smith era. For me, someone's been just been kind of happy that we've had Doctor Who at all. This is just more the kind of stuff I enjoy. And I'm okay with. I'm fine with. But what about you, dear listener? Let me know in the comment section down below. And you will be right out in a future video. Next week's video, most likely because there is an episode next week. But anyway, thank you all for listening. And see you next time. Goodbye! Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, favourite, subscribe, click the bell, and do all the YouTubey stuff that YouTube wants you to do. Go on, it'll do me a power of good. Until next time, my friends, goodbye!